Ombet.com, number one MMA sports book in the world. They offer the best UFC odds, live betting, and covers all big MMA promotions with huge prop markets and odds. Ombet also runs an exclusive MMA pick'em for UFC events. Parlay each event went up to $2,500 in cash. Entry fee is only $1 for each bet slip. Use promo code Fight Society and get the best MMA bonus out there. 200% bonus. Sign up today at ombet.com. That's ombet, O H M B E T.com. Check it out. You're listening to Fight Society with Damon Martin and Jeremy Loper. Check it out. Happy almost Halloween. I'm going to work on my Dracula. It's that time of year. Dude, it is. I've been on a Rob Zombie kick. I've been uh, watching all the movies. Oh, yeah. House of the Thousand Corpses, I watched. What's the name of the second one? Uh, Devil's Rejects. Devil's Rejects. Thank you so much. Which is so much better than the House of a Thousand Corpses, in my opinion. Yes. I think you see like an evolution every movie Yeah, with him. I haven't seen the Halloween yet, but I saw Lords of Salem, which is sick. Have you seen that? I have not seen that. I didn't hear good things about that. Oh, I don't know who you're talking to. It's fun. I mean, it's <laughs> it's really good. I mean, do you like Sherry Moon Zombie? Yeah. Yeah. She's super hot. Every movie. She's a good actress. It's a slasher type flick. Cool thing about Rob Zombie's movies, there's not a lot of like over the top paranormal. Yeah. Like, well, okay, no, that's wrong. There's not a lot of like super mystic powers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like where somebody has like uh, more than human strength, except for Tiny. (laughs) And except for Halloween Remake, which is Michael Myers. I haven't seen that yet, though. That's what I'm saying. But like for the most part, what is terrorizing is that actual humans capture other humans and do the most effed up stuff ever. Yeah. Yeah, that's – that was always one of the more terrifying things about movies like that. Like, you know, when somebody made – when they made Texas Chainsaw Massacre and they made – you know, movies like that where it's like, you know, these these things could really happen. Like, those freak people out a lot more. Like, remember that movie uh, that came out a few years ago, The Strangers? No. Oh, that's like, – it's it's a it's based on another movie from Europe called Them, which I saw first, which okay. is equally as creepy, which is basically this couple goes and lives on – they go stay on a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere – and these mass psychos just come in and start like messing with them, like you know, coming to the house, like trying to get in, what? you know, trying to kill them. And like the, it, the, the the movie is just basically set in the in the in the theory that these people just show up, like you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're separated, kind of you know, kind of separated from the world, and these people show up and start messing with them. And Wait, it, in the American version, it's called what? The Strangers. The Strangers. But at the end. When they finally, like, they capture the husband and wife and, like, they're, you know, torturing or whatever. And then, like, at the end, they're just like, why are you doing this to us? Why are you doing it to, this to us? And the people are like, because you were home. Which is the creepiest thing ever. They had no, like, there was no rhyme or reason. They didn't have any, like, personal grudge against these people. They just wanted to fuck with somebody. Which is just terrifying. Because that can yeah, happen to anybody. Is. You know what I mean? Like, there's no, no like, totally. Because you're looking for, you're looking, anytime anything happens to anybody... It's like that you search for that reason. Like my, I had my, oh, apar- I had my apartment. Wait. What? Do you remember that? Liv Tyler yeah. was in this movie. Yeah. Steven Tyler's daughter. Yeah. From Aerosmith. Wait, 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 wait. I think so. You can finish your thought, but I'm yeah. just I, It's, it's kind of like what, what happens when, uh, when, when you get like robbed, you know, at home and you're like, why would this happen to me? Why, you know, what happened? Why did somebody Has do that this happened to-, to you before? I have had my apartment robbed back in, uh, Ugh. like after college. And so like you walked in and just somebody had just ransacked oh, yeah. the place. Just really? Ransacked. Did they mess it up too? Uh, no, they didn't. They just, it was more of a, like a smash and grab because they grabbed like a lot of DVDs and like DVD player and things like that. And like my, uh, at the time, I think it was like a PlayStation 2 or something like that. And, and video games and stuff like that. And they had unplugged the TV, but this is back before like current age of TV. So I had a big, yeah, you know, big TV. And there was no way they were, oh, they, were they, they unplugged it like they were going to take it. And they were like, fuck that. Yeah. So Too it was much. just, but it was just like a lot of like, it was a smash and grab kind of thing. Like they went Dude, and grabbed, you know, grabbed, grabbed as much stuff as they could. The first time I ever met Matt Brown, uh, he came into the show. I mean, this is years ago, and he had just gotten his stereo yanked out of his car. Oh, yeah. And he walks in, swear to God, he goes, man, that's like the fourth time. 
I just was like, oh my god! I just picture him going to the store like the third time, buying a new stereo, and then like the idea—he was going to put up cameras and all this stuff. I was just thinking in my mind, like the idea of Matt Brown catching somebody, or any <laughs> any active UFC current roster, you know, anybody retired in the UFC ever to fight professionally, and you are the one that they catch robbing their stuff. Yeah. Good luck. Have man. fun with that. Yeah. Then it's, it is a whole new kind of horror movie. Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of like to my point of, you know, even you experiencing that, like, I'm sure you had fantasies about like, oh, I'd like to get a hold of it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like you, every time something you trip over something in the street, step on gum, anything that happens, you're like, oh, I wish those robbers were here right now. Yeah. Then it's funny, the robbers really... You lose the scary part of it when you call somebody a robber. <laughs> You're a robber. Well, welcome to your favorite MMA podcast. It is Fight Society. And uh, hey, you know, rate this podcast if you're listening on iTunes. It, it helps our standing with iTunes. We really do appreciate that. I'm Jeremy Loper. That is Damon Martin. You can follow us both at Damon Martin, at Jeremy Loper, Instagram, Twitter. We're on uh, Snapchat. I'm at Lope Ness <laughs> on Snapchat. <laughs> but we, uh, and we got a good show today, too. We're going to be talking to two fighters uh, who are competing at UFC 217, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who makes his return to action against Jorge Masvidal, which is a phenomenal fight. And then we're going to talk to Mickey Gall, of course, the man who defeated CM Punk uh, a little over a year ago and then defeated Sage Northcutt, making his return to action against Randy Brown. And who's rocking a super sleazy stash. Yes, he is. He is. And uh, so we're going to talk to those guys today. But I will say we're a day late on the podcast because we usually put the show up on Tuesdays. That's usually <sighs> when we record. But we had to go a day later because my co-host, Jeremy Loper, is now the superstar who's filming Wendy's commercials here in Columbus, Ohio. Wendy's, of course, <laughs> the, 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 the place with the little bacon cheeseburger, junior bacon cheeseburger, excuse me, and the home of the five-piece nugget, which is based out of Columbus, Ohio, by the way. Corporate office is like 10 minutes from here. Yeah, like it's, it's in Dublin, Ohio, where, yeah. we, where we both live. Yes, so you... Mr. Celebrity, we're filming at Wendy's commercial yesterday. Well, so we're doing a campaign. My family and I are in Randy, of course, my wife. And we're doing this whole deal that integrates with our radio show and then the online component of what we do. So we're doing uh, – they're, they're having – so you said nuggets. Wait until you try the ten- – this is no uh, advertisement, by the way. Wait, <laughs> yeah. I know this is, sounds like an advertisement. Well, wait, I have, we, did, we filmed yesterday. It was the first time I've ever had these tenders, right? They hire us to promote these tenders is basically what happens. Dude, these things are delicious. <laughs> Makes you want to slap whoever has given you a tender right in the mouth and then put a tender of this kind of Wendy's tender in their mouth. Unbelievable, dude. It's so I mean, especially dudes that are training. I mean, there's some breading on there, but it's not it's not uh egregious yeah. breading. You know, it's 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 decent and it's so good. It's so good. So we were doing this uh Wendy's commercial where we we do the drive through, right? Yeah. So the first location that we were supposed to do fell through for whatever reason, and so we were like in a free fall. We had to go rogue. We had to go to a Wendy's location and just pick it and just do it, right? Yeah. So we picked this one near my house, and so we're driving. We had to drive through the drive through. I swear, like three or four times, and we're ordering some goods. We had to get this shot. It took us twice to realize that we had to order less stuff because the shot that we needed was – them handing us the bag and me accepting the bag. We had like GoPros all over my car, you know, the dude with a full camera set up, microphones, the whole deal. <laughs> we go up the first time and order like $68 worth of stuff, <laughs> like for Rizostis, <laughs> all the tenders you can handle. Meanwhile, they have, you know, Wendy's is cooked to order. Yeah. So they have to make all this stuff. <laughs> so they're like, can you pull forward for a second? <laughs> <laughs> no shot. So then we go through the second time. I order one too many frosties, and they had to like redo the frosty oh, mix, man. and like so. Then we had to pull for. Please pull forward and wait. Oh no! Yeah, finally the third time we got the shot, but it was hilarious. So it's going to be a, a quick one. But if you follow me on any of the social media, I'll tweet it out. Or, you know, put it up there and people can check it out. Wendy superstar Jeremy Loper. Well, that's my Like I said, my wife, Randy, who we do the radio show together here in Columbus. And then uh, we have four kids. So <laughs> it got rowdy, man. <laughs> there were chicken tenders flying everywhere. Oh, dude, our baby Knox. He's four. He's just he was loving. He's like because the whole thing was like with the dipping sauces, too. So they have so many different dipping sauces. No. Dip, no dip. So remember the the song, uh, when you dip, we dip, we dip. Yeah, put yeah. your hand up. So we wrote a parody to that. Okay. When you... Put the chicken tenders on your lips. 
<laughs> you got a dip, no dip, or dip. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, Wendy's, uh, Wendy's superstars over here. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I, it was just so funny. I, I, I was coming in to, to, you know, record the podcast. It was the day before. And I get a text it's like, oh no, can we record another day? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he's like, I'm shooting a Wendy's commercial. That's just <laughs> not the text you expect. Like, what? Like, where is this coming from? You're shooting a Wendy's commercial? Yeah, the, well, the, I don't know whoever, took over dave thomas's fortune like uh, just lives up the street like his dave thomas lived up the street from me yeah and uh like two houses maybe three houses up from urban meyer like dude the wendy's compound is out of this world <laughs> watch your mouth so we uh we have a lot to talk about this week a lot to get into so where do you want to start uh let's start with uh with the the, the, the news or the lack there i'm still waiting on the news i should say we kind of talked about this last week but the continuing saga of what comes next for Conor McGregor, uh, because, uh, you know, everyone came, everyone seems to think it's going to end up being Tony Ferguson, which, uh, you know, I know Artem Lobov had said recently he thinks it's going to be Tony. And then Conor released that tweet, which was kind of innocuous with him looking like Tony Montana from Scarface. Ooh. And he just put the, he just put the word Tony. He didn't say anything else, but it kind of seemed like he was motioning towards Tony. Ferguson. But that's a big statement for Tony Ferguson to be acknowledged by Conor McGregor. Do you yeah. think that that's how it is this uh, these days, like in the UFC? If you are acknowledged by Conor McGregor, like that is like whoa, 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 getting into like the big time now. Yeah. Well, in this day and age, where we're at, you know, where the UFC is at, I mean, you got this new TV deal they're trying to work on for next year. Uh, you know, their pay per views have been down all year. I mean, did you see the pay per view numbers for UFC two fifteen and two sixteen? All those side by sides. UFC 215, and this is information according to Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer, who is, you know, the guru when it comes to pod, when it comes to pay per views. He, he knows his stuff. He said UFC 215 did 100,000 buys, which was Amanda Nunes and Valentina Shevchenko. And he said uh, UFC 216 is trending towards about 150,000 buys. And so how far off is that from like a normal, quote, a normal well, UFC pay-per-view? There's no, the problem is there's no normal pay-per-view anymore because everything kind of spikes and valleys. I mean, you get UFC 213, which was Robert Whitaker and Yoel Romero. That one tanked. That was another really low one. Like, but that, you know, you know like, uh, fair enough. That was not supposed to be the main event. No, it was Nunes and Shevchenko, but that took place a month later and it tanked. So there's no yeah. guarantee that was that just the co-main? Is that what it was? Yeah, it was just the co-main. Yeah. Man, that's even a... Yeah. Kind of a weak code. But then you have John Jones and Daniel Cormier, which does like 850,000 buys. So it spikes, there's just spikes in values. Like this whole year, like Holly Holm and Jermaine Duran Damme in February did terrible numbers. Woodley and Wonderboy in March did okay. But I would, I would, I guess at this, I guess. Okay. What about Jones Cormier? Well, that's what I said. That did like 850,000 buys. That's the biggest one of the year. By that's far, the, right? That's the anomaly, though. Yeah, that's yeah, the, yeah. Oh, that's the biggest anomaly of the entire year. So because, last year, how many 1 million pay per views? Did they have uh, like three? Right, four, four. They had four. They had Connor Diaz one, Connor Diaz two, Connor Alvarez, uh-huh. and Ronda Rousey's return. Um, was there Brock Brock Lesnar in there? No. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Five yeah. Brock Lesnar UFC 200. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. Good call. So there's five. This yeah. year they're not going to have one. Not even one. Not unless Connor I'm, decides to fight on December 30th, which I still don't think is going to happen. The There's, press between Bisbing and GSP is amazing, but like, do you think that it's really see? Here's the, the in? here's the problem, and I, I've said this to a couple people just in chatting online, and we might as well just discuss it now since we're kind of talking about Connor and his star power. Is what is GSP's drawing power right now? Because four years ago, he was the guy. Oh, absolutely. But four years ago. Canada was way into the UFC and mixed martial arts. I think no one saw this coming. Here's my take on it. I think no one saw this coming. I think George's public persona rests on a victory over Michael Bisping. It does. No one could have predicted that six months ago. It's outrageous the way that Michael Bisping has been able to position himself, but also I believe – the doubt that he's been able to put in not only people's minds, but possibly George St. Pierre's mind about beating him. Yeah. I, you know, if you asked anybody when that first, when that fight was first talked about, no one wanted to see it. George was going to win hands down. And now as we get closer, people start to examine that fight and they go, Oh, wait a second. 
Michael Bisping is quite a bit bigger than George St. Pierre. You see him go face to face and you realize that that's definitely in two different weight classes. And Bisping's not exactly the biggest middleweight in the world either. No, I mean, not the put, biggest. No, for sure. I mean, he's taller, but you put him next to like Yoel Romero, who's thick. Uh huh. You know what I mean? Like, he, you know what I mean? Or even Rockhold. Look at Rockhold when he stood next to him. He looked a lot bigger than Bisping. Absolutely. And uh, what would Wyman? George St. Pierre against Luke Rockhold look what, uh, look like yeah. if he was able to beat Bisping? So yeah. this will be really interesting, but I, I think for the first time that George St. St. Pierre, like really, it's almost like he's coming back in a real comeback sense. Like there is a lot. Like we are not actually looking at the George Rush St. Pierre that left four years ago. We're judging you as a different person right now. You have something to prove. And and I think with that comes how many people are interested because the buzz for this card, as big as this card is, doesn't seem to have the same kind of buzz as a as a previous GSP fight. And I just wonder, you know, has time passed him by a little bit? You Because our tastes as a society change over time. Four years ago, when George was the biggest pay-per-view draw in the sport, you know, he had Canada behind him. There was just something about GSP because the guy didn't put on the most exciting fights. And he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't say crazy things. You know what I mean? He had a couple rounds where he yeah, fights. He just had the Diaz. streak, really. Yeah. He just had, he just had this, he just had a following. You know what I mean? It's just, he had this, this crazy. Well, he's honorable. He didn't, yeah. you know, like you said, he didn't talk shit. But so. he had this crazy following, but a lot changes in four years because now, you know, we got, we got used to our superstars being Conor McGregor, who is the most prolific trash talker of all time. We got used to Ronda Rousey with that mean mug, that kind of, you know, that no nonsense, I'm going to destroy you. Just, you know, she would, she would, when Ronda, when Ronda was at her peak and she would say things like, I'm going to walk through this chick or whatever, you just believed it. You know what I mean? Because she was, she was an annihilator. There's no evidence Um, to believe otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So our taste change. I mean, just think about it this way. What you watch on TV four years ago versus today, what you go to the movies four years ago versus today, our tastes change. And so I'm just, I'm not trying to, shit on his return and say it's not going to be huge but you just wonder will the same audience that used to just pay for george no matter who he fought no matter when he fought you know he would always guarantee to get you you know six hundred thousand buys which is you know by today's standards is really good are those same people going to come out and buy gsp's return fight against bisping i think it'll do well because the card is stacked i mean you get cody garbrandt and tj dillashaw which is my favorite yeah, fight that's the, card. the best fight on the card you got yoana and jacek against rose namajunas you got our guest today wonder boy against masvidal uh, which is a sleeper yeah there's some good fights on this card real good fights on this card but there's just no guarantees like i actually when connor returns i don't care if he fights tony ferguson he fights nate diaz he fights khabib he fights you that's gonna do a million buys it's connor Connor could fight anybody at this point, and it's going to do big money. But can GSP still draw that? I have questions. And I don't think we're going to find out those answers until the night of the fight when we start seeing things like trending on Twitter and you know seeing the reaction. Because I know the last couple of pay-per-view cards, when I start tweeting that stuff on pay-per-view nights, the reaction, the amount of likes, the amount of retweets, the, the, the trending numbers, I keep an eye on social media, kind of lets me know the engagement of you know people. Because... Even with my paltry number of Twitter followers, which is only like 25,000, which isn't that much. Oh, no, yes. Oh, no, uh, but, no. but even that, you get a cross section of people because I have some people who follow me for Nerdcore Movement. I have some people who follow me for MMA. I have, you know, just people who follow me. And the engagement and with hashtags and things like that, the engagement, you feel like if I put out a tweet about something, whatever. You probably got a lot of Wendy's fans to follow you. Wendy's just fans as well. Friends. Yes, exactly. Now I've been becoming a <laughs> Wendy's superstar. But when you, when you see that, like if I put out a tweet on fight night, you know, Conor McGregor knocks out Jose Aldo in 13 seconds. Let's just hypothetically say on a big fight night like that, that thing will blow up. I'll get a million retweets, <laughs> a million likes. It just blows up because everyone is talking about it. Yeah. Like it was the night when Ronda Rousey fought Betch Cohea. When that happened, I remember just a billion people just talking online and just your, your Twitter timeline goes nuts. Yes. You know what I mean? The la this year has not felt like that outside of John Jones and Daniel Cormier. Like every event, it's like, where are people at? Like where, why aren't people reacting? And I agree. the trends show on pay per view that's because no one's watching. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that is a, ga- that is absolutely a gauge of measurement. For mixed martial arts is how much people are buzzing about it online. That's where we are in a society today with social media. If you're not I got talking news about for you, them, that's where we are with everything, man. Well, that's like, what I'm with saying. Rock so, music with everything. Absolutely. So that's my point. Like the night of two seventeen on November fourth, which is only a couple weeks away, 
is the buzz going to be there? I hope so. Yeah. Because the fight card is big. GSP's return should be huge. But I just can't guarantee that. And I'm not trying to be like the negative person that the glasses have empty, you know, saying it's going to be terrible. Because I'm not saying it's going to be terrible. I'm just saying that I don't think it's going to be a guaranteed blockbuster the way that everyone, you know, just immediately assumed when GSP returned that it's going to be a blockbuster because GSP is involved. I don't know that those same fans that were buying his pay-per-views four years ago are going to come out of the woodwork and buy them now. And the casual audience who has come to expect a Conor McGregor red panty night show, right? are they going to attach themselves to George St. Pierre now, four years later? Those those people who will buy Conor no matter what he does, no matter where he goes, buy Ronda, no matter who she fights, no matter what she does, Will those fans translate into GSP fans, the casual audience? And I tell people this all the time. When you're on, you know, when you're, when you're putting out messages and you're trying to get a, you know, a gauge response on like, you know, if you put something on a, on a podcast, even our podcast, listen, I understand that our podcast, the majority of people who listen to us are hardcore MMA fans. You know what I mean? Like typically that's, that's how it works. Absolutely. Um, but when you live in that hardcore MMA bubble, you forget about the majority of people who buy UFC pay-per-views or the people that the UFC are typically targeting aren't the hardcore fans. The hardcore fans typically make up about 10% of the fan base, I would imagine. Uh, when you get into the hardcore, when you get into the casual audience, you're talking about the guys who are, you know, sitting around on a Saturday night. Oh, let's, you know, let's rent a pay-per-view. Let's watch yep. the fights. Let's go out to the bar. Let's, you know, let's go to Sirens and hang out with Loper. <laughs> watch some fights they're not targeting the hardcores because the hardcores are going to be there regardless that 10 percent of the audience is going to buy or, or be there regardless they're worried about the other 90 percent of the people yes the people who don't buy every paper who might only buy one or two a year maybe just like with boxing or other events you know what i mean they're just think about the super bowl as big as the ratings are for the super bowl not that many people tune in every week to watch the NFL, as big as the NFL is, you no, know what I mean? But no. everyone wants to be a part of the Super Bowl. It's, you know, whether it's the commercials or just the pageantry of it all or whatever. Everyone tunes in to watch the Super Bowl, even if you've not watched a single NFL game all year. And that's kind of what it is with pay-per-views. You want somebody to plunk down their money on a Saturday night to watch this. And when you put out a George St. Pierre, a Conor McGregor, a Ronda Rousey, you're expecting people who don't typically buy a pay-per-view or who haven't typically bought a pay-per-view to put down their money. That's who they're banking on. That's who needs to be there to make 700,000, 800,000, 900,000 buys. And I just don't, I, I have questions whether GSP can still draw that audience. I think with uh, GSP coming out and having so much pressure, I think we're going to see the true GSP. We're going to see everything he has. I really think that this is exciting in the way that GSP is going to come out and fight like his back is against the cage for the first time in a long time. It's you know, he fought in, in the John Hendricks fight. But I think that he is going to go for the finish like we've never seen before. Because a George St. Pierre, George St. Pierre finish over a guy a full weight class above him. That's the stuff legends are made of. It is. That's the stuff you tell your kids about. And there's been a few of those moments, but I'll tell you, man, that could eclipse a lot. Put him back in a really prime spot to come and have two huge fights. Because wouldn't you say, Damon, he's probably... At the most, three amazing fights left. He said he signed a new four fight deal with the UFC, so yeah. that's the max. I think it's four fights. I don't think he'll re-sign a new deal. Beyond that's a good that. guess. I didn't even know that, and that's you know, I mean, that sounds about right. You yeah. know, if he, if he does the fourth, are you? Here's my question: Are you excited about GSP's return? I am because I'm a fan. I'm a karate guy. You know, everybody knows that. You know, so it's like. Anytime these traditional karate guys, you know, have a platform, I, I love I love George St. Pierre because George is George. George is not trying to be somebody else. He doesn't know how to be somebody else, and that is the most pure form I think of just being a human being and just doing what you do, man. And that's a it's a great thing, you know. It's a great thing. It's it's cool that he's not Conor McGregor. It's cool that he's not Nate Diaz. It's cool that he is uh, the guy who is the role model, but not like in a corny way. Yeah. You know, like, unfortunately, a lot of people think, you know, John Cena from wrestling is kind of corny. Yeah. You know, he does a lot for kids, but, you know, it, some of the gimmick is corny. George is just straight up, man. He's the guy that you, if you were in a karate class when you were younger, you know, like, and you looked up at your sensei, 
George St. Pierre is a mad that that's that's the guy you imagine who your sensei was. No. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about all these steroid allegations made by uh, Michael Bisping? I think it's I think it's just one of those things that you start tossing out there, see what sticks to the wall. You like you're trying to get under your opponent's skin. Now we and, know a lot of times these guys are tossing when they know. Yeah. Well, I also think that, you know, but Bisping because GSP made it such a big ruckus about drug testing when he left back in 2013, you know, he made a he was very loud about that that he wanted drug testing in you know enacted in mixed martial arts more stringent testing, and with a guy like that, you would assume that he's not cheating uh, because he was the one pushing for it. And I think that is part of it because I mean, there has there been allegations? People, you know, I mean, Nick Nick Diaz threw it out there. Yeah, there's been allegations, but there's never been any proof. And when a guy comes out and kind of bangs that drum to say, I want more drug testing, then what's the easiest way to get under his skin? Accuse him of cheating. So Bisping's not a dummy. Bisping knows what he's doing. Bisping knows how to press the button on GSP. I mean, at that press conference, he's had a couple of them now where he just goes after George. I mean, the whole alien thing, I was dying when he said that. When he went after him on the alien comments, when he said, that uh, is pretty funny. He said I'm going to hit you so hard, you're going to think the mothership has come back to get you. I did like that. I was, <laughs> I was on the floor, and I was just like, oh, my God. And is it getting to GSP? Maybe. You know, he keeps noticing GSP with the whole tongue-in-cheek thing, and he looks, like, really annoyed. Looks like he's, like, yeah, constipated. totally, totally. Uh, it, you know, because remember, the last guy who really got under George's skin, who really got under his skin, was Nick Diaz. And, 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 and St. Pierre didn't fight like himself that fight. He won. He absolutely won that fight. But he didn't look like himself in that fight. And that was towards the tail end when he was kind of getting, you know, burnt out on MMA and all those kind of things. But you could tell that trash talk got to him a little bit. It didn't, it didn't ultimately cost him the fight, but it definitely, in my opinion, affected his performance a little bit. And so you wonder if Bisping is just needling at him, trying to get George to come out and be aggressive, to go for that knockout, to really gun for it. Because if you remember GSP's style, when he did that, when he really gunned for it, when he really went out there looking for the finish, the last time you really truly remember him doing that, where he just looked at a balls to the wall kickboxer, was the Matt Sarah fight, the first Matt Sarah fight, when he thought he would just Ooh, roll through true. this yeah, dude. Totally. And Sarah caught him and finished him. And then after that, GSP became the wrestler, you know, the grinder, you know, that kind of guy. I'm not faulting him for that. I don't I don't think anyone can fault him for a smart game plan, but he keeps talking about I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna look for the finish. I'm gonna look for the finish. That's not necessarily who George was. So maybe the finish is a takedown transition to submission. Maybe I don't know. I'm curious. What's Michael Bisping's jujitsu rated? Uh, I don't know. He really hasn't. Bisping hasn't been taken down all that much outside of a couple fights. You know, he got taken down by Tim Kennedy in their fight. His wrestling, right uh, right now. but he hasn't really ever been in any danger of submissions. But he's also oh, never, Tim Kennedy took him down, right? Tim, Kenne- Tim Kennedy took him down, and then uh, and then uh, Luke Rockhold submitted him with a guillotine choke. That was the one time he's been submitted. Yeah. So it might happen. I don't know. Speaking of karate, yes, your background, our first guest. I am the original karate hottie. There you go. She's making her comeback in December too. Uh, against Tisha Torres, uh, December second. That's that fight. But November fourth, UFC two seventeen, Wonder Boy Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson makes his return to action against Jorge Masvidal in a fantastic fight. Yes. Uh, Wonder Boy, of course, coming back from the loss to Tyron Woodley and surgery and making his return to action as he climbs back up the welterweight ranks. So let's talk to uh, Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson. You, hey, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Doing good, brother. Doing good, man. Just got done doing some training. Good stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you taking time to chat with me as always. No problem at all. So, uh, so how's everything in uh, in South Carolina, man? Obviously, uh, fights creeping up just around the corner. I'm sure you're excited to get back in there. I know you've been out for a little while, dealing, you know, had some injuries and you know surgery things like that. So, how excited are you to be uh, back in a fight? Oh man, I'm super excited. You know, it's, it's been you know since uh, um, you know last March and. Uh, just excited to get back out there and do some work, man, back into training and been training hard for the past, you know, shoot. Uh, well, directly after the surgery, to be honest with you, just to keep the body moving, keep the body in shape. Uh, so it was, made, it was a little bit easier to get, you know, when you're already in shape to get in shape for the fight. So everything's feeling good, man. Just got done training and, uh, got some guys in town ready to, ready to get some good sparring in and had Chris in last week, Chris Weidman in last week for, uh, you know, for some training as well. So 
man, body's feeling good, no injuries, ready to do battle on November 4th. I love it. I love it. Let me backtrack a little bit with you, Stephen, ask you about the uh, the surgery. I know you had talked about it numerous times. I think we even talked about it. But, I mean, how was it coming back from that? And, and I assume at this point you feel 100%. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was actually easy compared to the other surgeries that I've had on my knees, you know. Uh, everybody knows, you know, a while back I tore every ligament in my left leg. Uh, the, the injury that I had previously was uh, torn MCL and meniscus. So the meniscus was actually fairly easy. The surgery was easy. It was just getting the MCL to, you know, to stop hurting whatever I would kick or move. Um, it, it would stay sore. had some cartilage built up, so I had to break that loose. Uh, which took me a little while to get back in the swing of things. and um, But now everything's feeling good, man. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, surgery was pretty easy. It was back up on it literally the next day. I'm still doing physical therapy on it just to make sure everything's nice and tight and strong when I step out there again. So uh, everything's good. Everything's good, man. Yeah. So, you you know, coming back, I mean, obviously we talked last year about, you know, the, the pressures and, and what went into that fight in New York. And you made no excuses whatsoever about what went right or what went wrong in New York. But you did admit it was tough with, you know, Chris on the card and, you know, kind of some of the other things that were going on with that that card. Now you get a bit of a do-over in a way. You know, you come back and here you are fighting in Madison Square Garden again. Does this, does this fight have a much different feel uh, than the first one? It does, man. You know, I mean, the, the, the first fight at Madison Square Garden, it was the very first in New York uh, at Madison Square Garden. So and it was a huge card. You know, it was main event, fight for the title. So there's a lot of pressure going into it. This one, I mean, you know, I fought there before. Um, it's not a title fight. Um, you know, I'm fighting a very tough opponent. Don't you know, get me wrong, but it, 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 it is, does have a different feel. You know what I mean? So the, the, all the attention's really not on me like it was last time or me and Tyron. Um, so we can just kind of kick back and do our thing. And uh, I feel more comfortable going into this fight than I have the last two. Um, so, uh, yeah, it does. It does It does have a, a little bit of different feel. Yeah. You know, one of the things, and, and this happens, you know, commonly in our sport, is, you know, when you when you reach the top of the top of the division, you fight for the title, and maybe you come up short, is is what happens in the aftermath. They, they talk about it all the time in football, you know, the Super Bowl hangover. You know, you, you come close to winning the Super Bowl, and then the very next year that team struggles because it's just like, you know, the motivation is tough to, tough to you know, duplicate from the previous year. Uh, how is it for you? I mean, you, you did come close on two occasions. You were, you were you know, right there. And I know it's heartbreaking not to have that title right around your waist right now but but how is that motivation coming back from that and then going into this fight oh man you know i, I still have i'm still not giving up on that title i'm going to go for it I'm, I'm in on all the way training as hard as i can uh to be able to get back and, and get that title shot again so it's it, you do hear a lot of that you, you see guys get very close next thing you know their next few fights are, are just awful because they just don't have that drive anymore because they like you said they get there, you know, at the, 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 that that moment, and it doesn't happen for them. They just kind of almost weather weather out. Um, I definitely don't have that mentality, man. I'm going to have that belt around my waist, and and towards Monsvidal is the guy that's standing in my way uh, to get that title shot. So I'm I'm training as hard as ever. Yeah. Well, and I, and I know that about you. You're not a guy who seems lacking in motivation, but, you know, obviously going out and having a great performance on November 4th answers all those questions, right? I mean, we can talk about it all day, but really it comes down to going out there and performing on the night, and it sounds like that's exactly what you want to do. Oh, exactly. You know, I do want to put on a good show. That's what I'm known for. That's what Masvidal is known for. You know, he's a great striker. I actually have some really good wrestling as well. I was watching some of his fights, in, you know, in the past. Uh, against some really good strikers. He does have some wrestling, um, very crafty, very, um, you know, um, good on the ground. As you saw against Danny Maya, he defended off him very well. So the guy, you know, he, he's, he's pretty much well-rounded. But, um, man, it, he, he's going to be a tough guy. And I know he goes out there. He brings it. Watch why they call him game break because he's always game, man. And it's going to be an exciting fight. There's a lot of people that are talking about UFC 217 and they're more excited about our fight than some of the other fights on the card. So uh, that, that also motivates me to train as hard as I can to go out and put on a great performance to get that W November 4th.
Absolutely. You know, Steve, during your career, you fought all different kinds of fighters from the guys who, uh, you know, maybe had said something before the fight. You fought very respectful guys. Um, I don't think that, that Jorge Masvidal has anything against you personally by any stretch of the imagination, but he does like to talk. I think we know that. He likes to get those intense face-offs and he likes to, you know, kind of, you know, jabber at guys a little bit in the fight and, and you know, in the in the stare-downs, things like that. I mean, do you have a, do you smile? Because you've seen it before. You've seen everything. You've seen guys who are respectful and you've seen guys who are not respectful. But when you face a guy like that, you know, you're such a nice guy. And I mean that as a compliment that it doesn't seem like it's going to affect you. But but I mean, how do you take that when a guy tries to, you know, mean mug you and try to get in your face and stuff like that? Like, do you have a hard time not smiling? Like, how do you how do you react to that kind of stuff? <laughs> you know, to be honest, I, I laugh, you know, I, I do smile because I know I know what these guys are trying to do. You know, I know what Tyron was trying to do in the past and Jake Yellenberger, um, you know, George Monsdabal, he does like to get his in opponent's head. Um, but uh, I respect him a lot. I know he, he respects me. But uh, when it comes down to it, we're going to be doing battle number four. So it doesn't matter what they do, what they say to me. I'll, I'm, I'm going to go out there with a smile on my face. And sometimes that's, that's kind of intimidating. To be honest with you, you got guys who try and get in your head. They can't do it. They're like, what the crap, man? <laughs> you know, this normally works. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, I'm just going to go out there and have some fun like I always do. I'm going to enjoy every minute of it with a smile on my face. Absolutely. I love that about you. Uh, let me ask you this, Steve. When you look at, you know, when you look at Jorge's style, you know, inside the octagon, you know, you take away even the Maya fight, which was a, which was a scrap. That was a close fight. Uh, you know, and, and obviously Maya is a top guy, so he's not an easy guy to fight. But you look at the fights before that, especially the Cowboy fight, where Masvidal came out very aggressive and just really went after him. And you know that Cowboy is a good striker. He's a dangerous guy. And your style is so much different. You have such a different style than anybody else in the welterweight division. But when you look at Masvidal, I I mean, do you invite that kind of style? Do you like that he's a, a pretty aggressive guy and he goes out there looking for the finish? Because it seems like with some of your counter striking, it almost seems like this is a style you know kind of made for you in a way. You know, yeah, it, it really doesn't matter. I, I face, like you said, a, a lot of different styles out there, very aggressive styles, guys that 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 weight on you or back up, and uh, he does have that style to where it's not crazy pressure, but he constantly mo is moving forward. Um, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter to me what kind of style you are. I'm going to go out there and do my thing. It does make it a little easier to land the strikes or have them run into strikes when they are overly aggressive. Now, Mazdal is a very smart guy. I don't think he's going to rush in there like Johnny Hendricks or Jack Ellenberger did, but he is going to keep that steady pace coming forward. He's got great kicks and, and a counter puncher, but uh, yeah, man, you know he's number four for a reason, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give it all I got and uh, you know, now look for the knockout. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But uh, I'm going to go out there and do work. Yeah. When you look at this card, you kind of mentioned it earlier. You know, when you look at this card top to bottom, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Three title fights once again. You got Bisping and George St. Pierre. I know a guy that you like and obviously have trained with in the past. Cody Garbrandt and, and TJ Dillashaw, and of course, Joanna and, uh, and Rose Nama Yunus. All great fights. But you mentioned something, and I think I have heard this quite a bit, is that a lot of people are keeping their eye on you and Masvidal. It seems like that is the, the people's main event, so to speak. I mean, are you getting a sense of that? No offense whatsoever to the three title fights, of course, but it does kind of feel like this is the one that everyone kind of expects to be you know at the end of the night uh the, the one that we're talking about the most with the crazy finish or or fight of the night or however you want to chalk it up yeah man i mean i think it is i mean that's what the from what i'm seeing and what i'm hearing that's what this is the the fight that everybody's wanting to see just because i think it kind of sets up everything else the very first fight on the on the main card um you know the pay-per-view card we are it so we're at, we got to go out there and put on a show for everybody else to you know leading up to these title shots. And even though it's not a title shot, man, it, it could it's got the potential to have you know fight of the night, one of the uh, best fights on the card. So uh, knowing that that's a responsibility, uh, you know, for me to train as hard as I can so we do put on a good performance, uh, you know, that Saturday. So um, yeah, man, it, it's exciting for me. I, I, I love the fact that people are 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 uh, talking about our fight than some of the other fights. And um, um, it just drives me to, to, to train as hard as I can for it. I know George is, and uh, he's going to be game, man. Um, so, yeah, it, it puts a smile on my, face knowing, on my face knowing that everybody's talking about our fight more than, you know, some of the, uh, the main events. 
Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you real quick, Steve, before I get you out of here, I want to ask about your, you know, your your opinion on the state of the welterweight division, where we're at right now, because this is a fight between two top five guys. I believe you're ranked number one. He's number four. Uh, obviously, you guys have, you know, both been near that, you know, the top of the sport right there. So this does have, in my opinion, title implications, because anytime you get two top five guys together, there has to be. Uh, but what are your thoughts on where the welterweight division is at right now? Because you got Tyron, who's kind of out with, you know, injury right now, and there doesn't seem to be a clear number one guy. I mean, they, they talked you know, briefly about Robbie Lawler, but obviously he just came back and had a very close fight with Cowboy Cerrone, and he hasn't booked his next one yet. I mean, you know, how important is this fight for the division, and, and where do you kind of feel like the division is at right now? <clears throat> well, you kind of said it. It's kind of up in the air right now. You you don't have a clear-cut number one guy. I mean, I was, I was ranked number one for a little while. Me and Robbie both were ranked number one for a little while. I think he's ranked number one right now. It's kind of going up and down with this. And it, I think, you know, with the win, uh, uh, this fight, it's got title, title, like you said, title, title fight potential. Um, so you'll, you, I think you're going to see a lot of the top guys fighting down to see who really is that number one contender. Even though Robbie is number one, he has been out for a little while. It was a close fight with Donald Cerrone. Um, so, you know, with a good win over, over Masvidal, hey, man, you might be seeing me and Robbie Lawler fighting uh, – you know, uh, next. So, uh, it's important, man. It, it is. And it's, and that's why it's so exciting. Cause you don't know who's going to get that next title shot. Like you said, Tyron is going to be out, is, is out for a little while and hopefully it's not too, too long, but, uh, uh, man, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. And that's what makes this, this division so exciting, I believe. Yeah. This is a tough question to ask because you just spent the better part of, you know, probably a year and a half of your life focused on Tyron Woodley. And now for the first time in a while, you're not focused on him. You're focused on Jorge Masvidal. And here I go ask you a question about Tyron Woodley. But uh, do you have it in your head, Steve, that at some point down the road you will see him again? I know he had made that comment that he felt like, you know, he's moved past you and that's, you know, he's putting it all behind him. But at the end of the day, the first fight was a draw. It's almost not to say it didn't happen. It was a tremendous fight, obviously. But you know what I mean. It's like, you know, it was it was a, it was a stalemate. It didn't end with a with a finish. And then obviously this last one, you know, kudos to him for getting the win. But again, very very close fight. Uh, and again, kudos to Tyron for getting the win. But do you feel like in your head you're gonna see him again? You're gonna cross paths at some point in the future? Oh yeah. I mean, if he's the title holder, he's gonna be seeing me again because I'm not giving up on that title. And like you said, the, the, the last two fights that we had were very close. Of course, we had the draw. It was controversial win that he had the last fight, but uh, he ain't done with me yet. <laughs> he's not done with me yet. If he still has that title, uh, you know, it, it, he's going to be seeing me again. It's just a given. I mean, uh, I want to beat everybody that I step out there with, and that's my mentality. That's the mentality a fighter has to have, you know, if that's their goal, if they want to be the best. So that's my mentality, man. And I know, I know Game Bray, that's his mentality too, that he's going to defeat everybody that steps out there so he can go for that title shot. And I'm not giving up on it. So he will be seeing me again. Yeah. Do you feel like this moment, you know, in this, in this thing, you know, it's like when you, when you had that, that setback against Matt Brown, now that was so early in your UFC career, really your mixed martial arts career in general. But after that moment, you know, you, you, you refocused and you went out there and we saw a new, uh, in my opinion, new Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. There was a hunger there, just something, you know, it's like you, you never wanted to feel that feeling again. And you went on that incredible win streak, you know, picked up wins over. I mean, look at, you know, Rory McDonald, what he's doing right now, and you beat him. And, uh, I mean, Robert Whitaker is the freaking middleweight champion of the world. You have a win, knockout win over him. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you feel like this is kind of the start of that again? Like, we're going to see that that wonder boy that is going to, you know, really, you know, once again go on that tear in this division. And, and Jorge Masvidal, for all the respect in the world you have for him, he just unfortunately has to be the first guy, uh, you know, in, in line to face you. Exactly. You know, that's I, I always come back stronger and better after after the loss you know and uh um i think like you said i i know this is this is what i want to do i'm a young 34 year old i haven't taken a a, a lot of damage so man uh, I'm, I'm i'm in the best shape i've ever been in man and i'm improving every day um like you said i came in this game not knowing a whole lot especially when it came to uh you know putting it all together the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu the you know the angles and stuff i'm still getting better man i'm i'm i'm, I'm improving every day and uh you're going to see you know a different steve wonderboy thompson uh november 4th um the guy that's not going to be giving up on that title so so yeah man you know after that i did lose um I always want to come back stronger when when I step back when I step out there and people are going to know that. 
Yeah. Well, I look forward to this. Steve. You know, I always love seeing you back in action, man. I always appreciate taking the time. Obviously, safe training the rest of the way. Safe travels to New York, man. Enjoy the fight. And uh, as always, man, I look forward to seeing you back in action. It's always an exciting time when you got a fight coming up. And uh, like everybody else, man, I think this is going to be uh, the one that is going to kick the card off right, and everyone's going to be talking about this one afterwards. Thanks a lot, my friend. Anytime, brother. Anytime. I always enjoy hanging out with you. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. All right, brother. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. You are not done with me yet. So says Wonder Boy. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. That's going to be a great fight. I yeah. think uh, Wonder Boy Thompson against Masvidal offers so many possibilities. I mean, if you are a stand-up striker and you love to watch stand-up striking or you're just a stand-up striking fan, this is going to be a fight that you're going to love. I don't... Th- Masvidal has a ground game. There's no doubt about that. His wrestling is strong, but that guy loves to stand and bang. Will he stand and bang with Wonder Boy Thompson? What's your call? I think he will because I don't think Masvidal fears anyone striking. He's got phenomenal boxing. He's got power. I mean, look what look what he did when I did to Cowboy. Yeah, I know Cowboy's not Wonder Boy in terms of style, but Cowboy's a damn dangerous striker, and Masvidal attacked him like he was nothing. You know what I mean? He went out there and just disrespected him, and I mean that in like a positive way. Like he didn't, he didn't respect his striking skills at all. He just went out there and assassinated that dude. Can he do the same thing to Wonder Boy? It's possible. Masvidal's a bad dude. So the winner of this fight is set up, you think, as the number one contender? No. Well, Dana, and this is a good reaction because we haven't talked about some of the new fights that have been made over the last couple of weeks. But uh, Dana White, well. I take it with a grain of salt because when Dana says something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. But he says that the new main event for the next Fox card in December in Winnipeg between Robbie Lawler and Rafael Dos Anjos right. will determine yes. the new number one contender. Now, do I buy that? Do I actually believe it? No, because I think it ultimately comes down to who looks the best. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got that fight. You got uh, you got Woodley. Uh, you got, excuse me, Wonder Boy and Masvidal. And then uh, next weekend, we're going to have him on the show next week, is Colby Covington, yeah. who takes on Damian Maya. If he can go out there and do what he says he's going to do, which he says he's going to retire Damian Maya, if Colby can go into Brazil and dominate or just beat Damian Maya convincingly, and there's bad blood with him and Tyron Woodley. Boy, did he take some shots at Tyron in that interview. And uh, his coach, too, Dean Thomas. Wait to hear that next week. Um that could be a possibility. Wait, Colby said some shit about Dean? Oh, yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah. So next week. I'll tease it. Next week. Wait till you hear this. Um, but uh, I'm not saying he's going to get the title shot. I'm just saying, like, that's that's an outside possibility as well because he has he, – he, I mean, he has just trashed Tyron Woodley in the press. You know what I mean? Now, he hasn't had the biggest platform yet, meaning like winning a fight and then, you know, freaking out on the microphone. He did it in his last fight against Dong Hyun Kim, but that was an international show. That's right. You know, yeah. this one with Brazil, it's on FS1. He's the co-main event. He has a chance to, you know, really kind of, you know, make his mark if he can win and then kind of make that post-fight speech. We'll see. I, I don't think he's going to get the title shot necessarily, but... I wouldn't count it out, especially you know, if if Wonder Boy beats Masvidal, which I think is very possible. I don't think they're going to make that matchup right away. And then Dos Anjos and Lawler, if that ends up not being a fun fight. Now, I think it'll be a great fight. I think it'll be an amazing fight, actually. But if it ends up being a stinker, maybe Dana says, all right, let's go to option option C. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be Colby Covington. So who knows? That's the thing. When Dana declares because, people... Because, yeah, all that shit talking, all that fun, everybody wants to see it. And right now, what does the UFC need more than controversy and eyes and, whoa, whoa, what's happening over here? Yeah. Yeah, nothing. I think pe- Do you think people are still weary from the summer a little bit, like from the Conor uh, Mayweather fight? Uh... I mean, honestly, because that was a lot of promotion, man. If you were just a casual and you invested... I'm not saying they watched all the pre-shows well, like we did and all that stuff with Brendan Schaub and all that, but like... Uh, you know, I mean, I do you think, think that people could be a little uh, punchy from the I, summer? I don't because the fight paid off. It ended up being a good fight. That makes all the difference. When it was Mayweather Pacquiao, the reason why we just we just had a huge hangover from that, that's why I think Mayweather's final fight against Andre Berto did horrible numbers, was because people got burned by the Pacquiao fight. The fight, Pacquiao fight was so boring that they're like, I'm not buying this shit again. Yeah, right. But no, Connor, I, I agree Connor with that. And, and Floyd, for all the hype, for everything else, it ended up being a fun fight. 
You and I sat there and watched it. We were on the edge of our seats the entire time. Really were. I mean, like, I thought it was a fantastic freaking fight. Yeah. I mean, like, so, I, you know, I, obviously he was carried a little bit yeah, for what it's worth, but I, I just, I just know for a fact that when you are in a real fight, man, you're fighting. Yeah. You're fighting. You know, like, God, Floyd Mayweather may be retreating or maybe evasive. You know, defensive. You know, people you know criticize him for not fighting enough, but that's still fighting. I mean, that well, is fighting. What, you know? That's what drives me nuts. People say he let him win a few rounds. It's like Con- that's Floyd's style. Floyd has never been great in the early rounds, and guys have made him pay for it. Shane Mosley made him pay for it in the third round of their fight when he nearly knocked him down and, and had him in trouble. You play that game, someone will eventually catch you. You know what I mean? So to say he wasn't fighting or he was letting Connor win rounds is crap. Absolute crap. You know what I mean? But anyways. So, yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of that, but I, I, the fight paid off. So I don't think it's that. I think it's that people want another Conor Floyd. They want another big fight. You know what I mean? And they, 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 they haven't had it. You know what I mean? They're making some great fights right now, though, that you hope will pay off. Speaking of which, I mean, UFC 218 in Detroit. Yes. December 2nd. Are you going to that or what's I up? am. I am going to that. Uh, December 2nd. Yeah, that's a little close because I'm going to uh, Virginia. Holloway obviously. and Edgar. Oh, my God. What a great fight. Francis Ngannou and Alistair Overeem. Yeah, dude, I love it. I love it. I love Justin, it. I love Justin it. Gaethje against Eddie Alvarez, which of course is going to be freaking be amazing. Too, and then yeah. they just announced, you know, they got Ally Aquinta against Paul Felder. So That's wait, going to be a great fight. That Ultimate Fighter is on right now. Yeah, with Gaethje. Yeah. yeah. Are you watching that? Uh, yeah, I watch it. Is yeah. it good? Um, I watch it. It's all right. I watch it. I'm not going to say anything else. I watch it. Is there anybody coming up that like, looks good? I mean, it's the flyweight title. The problem is, is that. Uh, the top flyweights who you think are going to be the champions aren't in there right now. Like Barb Honchak is legit. Yeah. And Roxanne Motiferi is legit. Um, Where are they at right now? They're just now through like the first round of the tournament. So oh, like okay. they haven't gotten okay. to like, but those two fighters are legit veterans, that kind of stuff. But what you're not seeing in this tournament are Valentina Shevchenko, Jessica I, who was the number one, one twenty five er when she moved to one thirty five. Uh, you know, Joanne Calderwood and Beck Rollins are both fighting at, at 125 now. I think JoJo is going to be a force at 125. Um, so these guys are they're coaching chicks, yeah, or women this, this yeah. season, yeah, yeah, 125. Wow, okay. but they I, just I, I they thought, just okay. They didn't pack the show with with the most well known. Not that not that flyweight is necessarily the most well known division necessarily, but. They should have decorated. Well, I won't say they should have because people had no interest in being involved. I know from like talking to Jessica, I I'm quite sure she had no involved, no desire whatsoever at this point in her career to go live in Vegas for six weeks to compete on the Ultimate Fighter. You know what I mean? Like it's just not yeah. for everybody. But when you look at this cast versus the cast of the Ultimate Fighter season twenty, which is the last time they crowned a champion, it's starkly contrasted in terms of talent. I mean, yes. Tough 20 had Angela Hill, who had, like, one pro fight. But she was ranked number 16. You had Carla Esparza, yeah. Felice Herring, uh, you know, Tisha Torres, JoJo Calderwood. I mean, it was loaded with talent. Now, I, admittedly, Claudia Gadelia and uh, and uh, Joanna and Jacek weren't on the show. You know, they weren't. One, you know, they, they one was because of, uh, from my understanding at the time, was because one of them didn't speak great English, and the other one was, you know, Struggle would she would struggle to cut weight that many times in a season, Got which it. I understand. You know what I mean? Cutting weight one day is different than cutting weight like four times over six weeks. Um, but uh, and yeah, you know, Claudia Gadelli ended up being a beast, and obviously Johan is the best. But that talent was still there. Carla Esparza was there. You know, Fleece Herrig was there. People who are still consistently in the top ten today. I don't know that we have that with this season. I, mean, I think Barb Honchak's legit. I think Roxanne Woodaferi is legit. There are a couple decent prospects. But I, I, when I look at the 16 fighters on this season of the show, I don't, I don't necessarily look at it and say, these are all going to become household names in the UFC. All right, fair enough. But when you talk about fights being made, so we, we mentioned UFC 218. Uh, a lot of fights have been made over the last couple of weeks we haven't had a chance to really talk about. But you got, uh, I mentioned, of course, UFC 218. We got you know the fight with Ally Quinta and Paul Felder just got made, which is amazing. Tisha Torres against the karate hottie, Michelle Watterson. That's coming back. That's going to be a great fight. Love that. Um, we didn't have a chance to talk about, you know, UFC 219. They've announced a lot of fights for that as well. Jimmy Rivera against Dominic Cruz. Yeah, so interesting. Dominic Cruz comes back, non-title fight. Yeah. First time in how long? God, non-title fight for Dom? Ten years. 
Yeah, it's got to be at least. Long time. Long time. Yeah. And that obviously you're taking into account that he was out for, you know, three and a half to four was years. Was Bush president? Yeah, it had to be. <laughs> That's fucking strange. No, no, it would have been. It would have been had to be Obama, right? That was what two thousand eight. Yeah, right oh, yeah, around yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I guess it was right around that Bush time. Yeah, that's a good headline. Since WC, first time Dom fought since Bush. <laughs> that's gonna be my next headline. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Dominic Cruz's first non-title fight since, since Bush. George Bush. Since like people Bush. Will be like, "What the fuck did he fight George Bush? <laughs> did Dominic Cruz?" Fucking sick George Bush out with that ridiculous footwork. Oh I think god. he did. Oh my god, that's hilarious. Hey Carol, come in here and get a look at his headline. <laughs> I think Dominic Cruz knocked out George W. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did. Hasn't fought in a non title fight since Bush. <laughs> since Bush. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. It's gonna be so disappointing if it's not true. Oh. We're, we're finding out. Damon is on the case right now. Let's see. The last time he fought in a non title fight. Uh let's see. When was it? He fought Brian Bowles. Uh, it was uh, 2009. Oh, crushed. Yeah. So that was Joseph Benavidez, the first. Damn time. you, Obama. <laughs> Is that like a, one of those damn you, Obama hashtags? <laughs> Took everything away from us. <laughs> damn you, Obama. We're, 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 we're two years away from the Bush headline. That's right. That's okay. Uh, but yeah, so Dominic Cruz is coming back. So yeah, we got a lot of stuff all day this weekend. And there's a fight card that nobody's talking about. I got to be honest. Is the fight in Poland, Cowboy and Darren Till. Oh, okay. First of all, I'm talking about this all day long. I think this is going to be a really interesting fight. This could be a real turning point if Cowboy loses this fight because this guy, Darren Till, is a Brit who is not effing around. This guy brings heat in his Muay Thai game. It is legit, and he's straight up. He doesn't think much of uh, Cowboys game. He does not think it's world championship level. And I I really look forward to this week being fight week, seeing some of the press that these guys are going to do, and seeing Till under that pressure of the spotlights. Because we've seen Cowboy. Cowboy doesn't budge. And where's the fight? Uh, Poland. Not a lot of water skiing going on in Poland. <laughs> So I wonder how Cowboy's going to do going up to fight week with uh, not a lot of extreme activity. Or is he going to be doing some Polish extreme activity? I want to know what there are Polish extreme activities to do. But it's a good fight. The card? <laughs> to, to quote Larry David, I don't know if it's pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> good. It's uh, it's not the strongest card in the world. I got to be honest. You know, the co-main event, Carolina K- Kabalkevich taking on uh, Jody Escabel. You know, good fight. I don't know if that's called co-main event, but be that as it may, the main event is good. You know what I mean? The main event, and it's a Saturday afternoon card. You know, the card takes place at three o'clock in the afternoon. Fights will be over by five. Still get Saturday night off. You know. Yeah, I mean it's cool, but what do, what do you think puts the the winner, the winner loser ratio? Well, what happens to Cowboy win and lose? Cowboy, Darren Till obviously with a win puts this guy's name all over the place. A loss, you know. I mean he's still uh, you know, he lost to Cowboy. Guy's this fight, forever. this fight is bigger for Cowboy than it is for Darren Till in my mind because Cowboy's lost two in a row. Now you could say he lost the the fight to Robbie Lawler, which in my opinion was a very close fight. That was mm-hmm. a very very mm-hmm. close fight to Robbie Lawler. Uh, but he lost to Masvidal. But I say this all the time. And this is why judging screw ups and and and, and referee screw ups are so big in the sport. Because at the end of the day, and I'm guilty of this just as much as you are, and as every fan out there is, is at the end of the day we look at the we look at the record. He's got two losses in a row. Now, do I remember that the, the Robbie Lawler fight was a great fight and very close? Yeah, right now. But if he loses to Darren Till, that's three in a row. At the end of the day, that's three losses in a row. Now, obviously, Cowboy's not going anywhere. The UFC, I think he'd lose five in a row, and the UFC would still keep him on the roster because it's freaking Cowboy Cerrone. But if he ever hopes to be in that upper echelon of the division again, he cannot lose to a guy like Darren Till who's not even in the top 15 right now. And that is bad news because this dude is about some shit. Yeah, he's a tough dude. So this is a big moment for for Cowboy. Is Cowboy going to be a contender again or is Cowboy just going to be the guy that accepts fights against anybody? You know what I mean? Like you don't you you want to be that guy but you don't just want to be that guy. You don't you want to be the guy who will step up and fight anybody. But you also want to be the guy who will step up and fight anybody in the elite part of the division. You want to be fighting Robbie Lawler. You want to fight Jorge Masvidal. You want to fight Matt Brown. You don't want to just be like, oh, Cowboy's available. Okay, let's put him in there against, 
you know, Joe Rookie over here because Cowboy's available. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the guy who steps up and has big fights, not just any fight. And I'm not saying it's make or break for Cowboy with a loss to Darren Till. Does he just suddenly drop out of the rankings and he's taking on, you know, a guy on the prelims? I'm just saying that you can't really risk that because three losses in a row, your next fight is probably not going to be against an elite guy. You're probably not going to be back at a main event or co-main event. And that's where you start playing that game. Now, I know Cowboy, from talking to him, he doesn't care. He's like, I, I don't really care if I'm the main event or the first fight of the night. But your paycheck matters, I promise you that. Oh, yeah. Because the UFC is not going to pay a curtain jerker 150 grand a fight. You know what I mean? Like You're not going to be that guy. So this is a big moment for Cowboy. He needs to go out there and look impressive and get a win over a guy who is solid, good prospect, but he's not a top 15 guy. When you look at Darren Till's record, impressive, but he's beaten nobody that you would really say is a legit like measuring stick for the division. I agree. I agree. But I think this guy, perfect age, perfect time against a veteran opponent to really, really make a case for his way up into the at least top 10. Well, that's what you get right now with the welterweight division. What's cool is, as tough as that division has been, we are seeing a couple people come up. We have Colby Covington, as I mentioned earlier in the show. You got uh, Maybe Com- that's the fight. Kamar Usman, yeah. who just came off a big win, big knockout win of his own. He's undefeated in the UFC. That kid is a beast. Yep, That's one of the guys I would say watch over this next year. Kamar Usman is the real deal. So you had that kind of young blood coming up. And so some of these more established veterans, like the Robbie Lawlers, you know, like the Wonder Boy Thompsons, you know, got to start looking behind them a little bit. They got to start looking over their shoulder a little bit. And so Darren Till could be that guy. If he beats Cowboy, he's in that same list because, you know, when you look at the guys who have beaten Cowboy in the UFC, it's a pretty short list, and it's pretty elite. You know, you talk about Robbie Lawler, you talk about Nate Diaz, you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Jorge Masvidal. You're not talking about a big list of guys who have wins over Cowboy. Not a lot, and dude, that for Till would be the world. I mean, that would that would put his name on the map, no doubt about it. Speaking of uh, welterweight prospects, our next guest is just that, Mickey Gall, of course, took on CM Punk last year, then took out uh, Sage Northcutt. He makes his return to action at UFC 217 against Randy Brown, and we're going to talk to him about that fight, talk to him about his next call-out, and, uh, and why, if you remember correctly, when Mickey fought against Sage Northcutt afterwards, he mentioned he was going to go to lightweight. You remember that? He said, I'm going to drop down to yes, 155. absolutely. This fight with Randy Brown is back at 170. So why isn't he going to lightweight? We'll talk about that with uh, with uh, Mickey Gall right now. Um, so, so what's going on? Not much, man. How's everything with you? I was uh, I was happy to see your name back in the headlines. It felt like it had been a little while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that was all, uh, that was all on purpose. So tell you know, I after my last fight, after my last fight, um, you know, I had the, I, I had the stitches that I got three weeks before the uh, the CM Punk fight. Um, doctor was like, "Yo, you gotta wait for six months." So, but I didn't do that, and then I got it recut open in the Sage fight. Um, so I wanted to give it the proper six months and actually, you know, let it, you know, let let it heal proper. And then also, it just bought me time to just keep getting better. I'm, I'm young. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 4-0 professionally. I won the smallest, maybe the smallest record in the UFC. Um, I get better so much faster than everybody else. So, like, I, I put in about, like, two or camps over this past time. But just, you know, just focusing on me, just focusing on my skills. And, you know, I'm really excited to, to show. It all went just the plan. It, it couldn't have, it was a success. Um, everything I, you know, I, I thought was going to happen worked. All my hard work paying off, and I, you know, I'm already a, uh, a way better fighter, and I, I'm excited to show it. Yeah. Well, I know fighters say all the time when you're just getting ready for fights, you don't necessarily get a chance to get better. You're just staying in shape and, you know, making sure you're getting ready for the next guy. And because you weren't dealing with like a knee injury or something crazy like that, it sounds like you really took advantage of the time away. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I made the most of it. I'm, I'm really, pr- I'm really proud of what I did. The past, uh, you know, like I guess it was like eight months. I, you know, I, I put in a lot of work, and uh, you know, a lot of MMA, MMA fighters can't do that. They can't unless they have like a finish line, like a goal right ahead. They can't just train. You know, it's a, I, I have a different type of work ethic, and uh, you know, like I, like I said, I, I'm I'm proud of, of what I've done these past few months. 
Yeah. Now, I know when you fought Sage Northcutt, and I know we talked after that fight, you had mentioned, you know, going down to lightweight. Uh, this fight came up, and unless I missed something, this is a welterweight fight again. So what uh, what was the decision-making beside, you know, behind staying at 170? Um, I, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of 170 pounders that still want it. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few that I'd still like to give it to. So, um, and I'm I'm big, man. You know, I'm I walk around over 200 pounds. I I I could have I made that I made the 170 pound the, the decision to stay at 170 pretty early. And in my time, you know, training in this last time, I you know I got bigger, I got stronger. I uh, I didn't I didn't feel the need to correct myself. I I you know I, I figured I'd let everyone ponder and, you know, may, maybe play with that little piece of misinformation uh, and just, just keep everyone on their toes. But, you know, I, I didn't feel a reason to say anything. I, you know, I, but yeah, it's 170. I'll probably stay up at 170. Yeah. So no, no, no future plans for 155, at least for right now. Yeah, probably no plans ever. I, uh, I, I thought about it and if there was a time, I, you know, I planned on doing it because I thought it would be a, a uh, I originally got it in my head, be, like, like I, you know, I, I talked to guys and they're like, they, they were like, ah, you might be able to make it. Like, I trained with like Jim Miller, who walks around, would walk around sometimes the same weight, or just only a little bit less than me. Um, but you know, I, I got a big frame, and it's, you know, I, I put even more on that, so it's seventy is a good spot. I, I was thinking about it, but I. I got that on my head pretty shortly after. Yeah. So now if you're walking around to around 200 pounds, obviously that's pretty big. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of welterweights to walk around around 190. Uh, so that's pretty big. I mean, have you added a lot of muscle, a lot of size in this downtime? Like added that as well? Um, yeah, I've, I've put on, I've, I definitely put on, I put on a little muscle, like, you know, and a little, little winter coat over the winter, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's gone now, you know, I'm back. You know, but but all like like healthy. I was just healthy. You know what I mean? I was I was I was eating whatever I wanted to, and and you know I was training hard as fuck. I I I, I was doing two days. I've been, I've been, you know, I I push I push my body to like like to, to dark places. You know what I mean? I, like I I'm telling you, I if, if there's one thing that I know, I I know I work harder than anybody. Yeah. With that said, you know, and I you put can... that time in, man. Yeah. Well, you know, here, here's the thing, you know, coming out, you know, since day one in the UFC, I mean, you, you've had a target on your back because of the whole thing with, you know, getting in the UFC and fighting CM Punk. So I imagine, you know, knowing that you always have a bit of a target on your back, you got to work hard, right? I mean, you can't get lazy because these guys are, you know, they want to be the guy to beat Mickey Gall. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love that. They should be. They, they should want to beat me because, yeah, I, I, I mean... Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in a better spot than all these fucking guys. You know, <laughs> they all want. They all want what I have, and they're. You know, they have to kill me to take it. I. I you know, I'm working really hard, and that's that's a, that's the motivation. I love hearing these guys call me out, dude. I, I love it. I. You know, I'm like, all right, cool, cool, good. Keep saying my name. Oh, I just got my name set on Fox. Good. Okay. Potential opponent. Potential opponent. Okay. You'll get yours. You'll get yours. I like. It's, I, like they're doing me so many favors, man. It's you know, uh, it's it's. Yeah. Now you, uh, you know, you have, you know, kind of become the king of, you know, calling your shot a little bit. I mean, you know, in that era, you know, when you had the early fight, you call out CM Punk, you got the fight. You you beat CM Punk, you call out Sage Northcutt, you got the fight. Uh, afterwards, I know you call that Dan Hardy. It turns out, you know, Dan doesn't look like he's going to fight, or at least it doesn't seem like he's going to fight anytime soon. But what were your thoughts when the UFC came calling with Randy Brown? Because that was kind of interesting, because that wasn't a name I was really thinking of for you. Um... I, I love it. I love this fight. I think it makes so much sense. You know, I'm the... When I fought Sage, I took the Dana White looking for a fight belt. I took that from him. And now I'm giving Randy a shot at my belt. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, it is. It is kind of... I mean, that's that's where that's where you guys came from. And obviously, Randy, you know, as he four fights into his UFC career, he's had some successes. So, uh, you know, he gets a shot at the belt. Yeah, he gets shot at the belt, exactly. <laughs> the DWLAS belt. I like it. I like it. What do you think of Randy? I mean, obviously, he's a tough guy. I think he's gone 2-2 two and two in his UFC career. He's got, you know, he's got some good wins under his belt. He's had a couple of tough losses. But what do you think of him? Um, I think Randy's, uh, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a good kid, very likable kid. 
um, a, a kind dude. He's a, he's a nice person. I've actually, you know, I've, I've, I've actually, we've, we've trained together um, a handful of times. And, and I, you know, I, I, I really don't have a bad thing to say about him as a, a person. I, he, he did do an article saying, he, you know, and I, I, he did do an article saying, oh, I beat Mickey Gall, I beat Sage Norska. And I was like, oh, oh, really, motherfucker? <laughs> like, I kind of, like, when I read that, I was like, oh, this is a nice, because I, I, I love the fight. I think he's a nice guy. And here's the biggest difference is I'm a performer. I go out there and I, I do, I perform. And, and you know, I, I, don't think, I don't see that out of him. I don't see, he doesn't, he doesn't have it in the moment. And also, I, I know how, you know, I just, I just know, I know we, you know, we, we train together. And it's, we haven't done much. We've, we've only done a little wrestling and jiu-jitsu, which everyone will say is, is definitely in my favor. But, and, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's all good. Yeah, you uh, you know, you you have become you know beyond being you know good inside the cage, you become really good outside the cage as well, and you have no problem you know speaking your mind on the microphone or doing interviews and things like that. I mean, I know you had some fun with Sage Norcut. Obviously, you had some fun with CM Punk as well. Uh, is it any different with Randy Brown? Do you, do you feel like you can uh, you can take some shots, or or because he is a guy that you know and and maybe you like a little bit? Do you will you will you pull will you hold back on the trigger a little bit? Um, no, nah, man, it's a doggy dog sport. It's, just, it's, a, it's a doggy dog world. And, you know, I, I'm, I gotta, I'm the big dog. I, I'm the, I gotta eat him up. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll eat him up whichever way I find, uh, whichever, every, 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 whichever way I find and, and, and like every way I find, uh, you know, I, we, you know, we, it's, 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 I, I don't, I really don't have too much like, like, that's, I don't think he's a, I don't think he's a corny dude. I don't think he's a fake. Uh, you know, I, I, I respect him. I, I like him as a person. But, you know, I'm getting there. I'm going to fuck him up. I'm, 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 I'm you know, I'm, I'm going to put him out. I'm going to take him out in the fight. And, you know, I, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of nice, like, kind of knowing the opponent and knowing, you know, you know what that, what that is. And I, I know I can handle it and smash it to this. Yeah. You know, you mentioned earlier, I mean... And I got yeah. something else. I got, some, I got something else for you, Damon. Oh, uh, okay. You just reminded me. Um, sure. About... You were talking about the call-outs, right? Right. Right? Yo, who brought back the fucking call-out? <laughs> me. Every single week, there's a new call-out. Every week, there's a new call-out, dude. There's a... Cyborg's calling out who she wants to call out on social media. This person's calling this person. I get called out every... Uh, Every couple months, like, <laughs> like yo, I I changed like for better for worse or for whatever, whatever reason. The fact of the matter is, I I changed the the culture a little bit. I changed the culture of the sport a little bit. I you know that I did that. that there's no doubt about that. I you know, you say what you want about who I beat, but uh, you there's like there's no doubt about that too. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's just fact. Well, I love it because I say this all the time. When you have that microphone and, and you have a captive audience, you better make the most of your time. You know what I mean? That's the one moment when everyone's paying attention to what you're saying. Take advantage of it. And you've been a guy who has absolutely done that. And guess what? You've gotten what you've asked for. Yep. And, uh, and I, and I, and I, uh, I'll I, you know, I got, I got this fight that I, I asked for too. I, I like this fight too. I know I asked for, for Dan Hardy, but, when uh, you know, I also I've I've also had my eye on Randy since uh, since he said he could beat me in stage in that magazine article. So now I am curious, uh, Mickey, with this fight, is it is it as much about me? Is it as much about fighting Randy Brown as it is getting a chance to fight at MSG? Because you wanted to fight at MSG last year, and the Sage North Cup fight got pushed back to December. But I know fighting in New York and fighting in Madison Square Garden was something that was really important to you. I know you really wanted that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm really happy that's happening. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's but what it's about is me staying undefeated and me doing something spectacular and taking another uh, motherfucker out. That's what it's about. I, you know, I, I do it in if it's Madison Square Garden. I'm that's so, so glad that worked out. I think that's really cool because to me, that's that's me being able to give like uh, back to home. I have family and friends from Sacramento to Vegas to Cleveland. Um, from my early amateur days. So being able to come back and do New York and all my family and friends could just drive into the city, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm, ha I'm happy I'm able to, uh, you know, kind of get back to my people. Yeah. 
Now, one thing you've been able to do so far in your UFC career is you have been a bit of a show stealer. I mean, that's something I, I, I don't know if you're looking for a nickname, but that's been something you've been able to do is be a bit of a show stealer. Now, you are going to be on a stat card this time. Three title fights, George St. Pierre's return, Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw, Joanna and Rose Namajunas. It's a big card, big opportunity, big spotlight. But do you feel like with even those three title fights and everything that's going on at UFC 217, do you feel like you still have the opportunity to steal the show? I, I always have that opportunity. Uh, I can always do that. It's 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 not it's you know it's my fighting style, but it's also just me. I just I like I know I can't you know I go in there and I perform. I, I perform over the top. I win fights. I know how to win fights. I always say I will always figure out how to win fights. Um, and you know, some some sometimes they come spectacularly, and and uh, you know I, I think they've all come pretty cool so far. But I, you know I'm cooking up something better. I'm cooking up something better every time. Now, you've been able to not only call your shot in terms of the, the people you want to fight, but you've also been able to call your shot inside the octagon. So when you look at Randy Brown, kind of play prognosticator for me, Mickey, how do you see yourself beating him? Um, several ways. I, 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 could beat him. I could beat him anywhere, man. I could, you know, I, I, could, I could hit him with a, with a big shot, put him to sleep. I could hit him with a big shot, put him on his butt, and uh, strangle him. I could... You know, take him down, throw him around, uh, slam him on his head, uh, strangle him, break his arm off, break this off. You know what I mean? I could. Uh, there's there's plenty of ways. There's a, there's, a, there's way more ways for me to win than for him. It, it's you know there's there's way more, there's, I'm I'm the dangerous guy in this fight. I'm way more dangerous. I, I, I'm I'm the more dangerous guy in any, every one of my fights because I I get you somewhere. Yeah, I'll always get you. Has the UFC told you yet? Are you going to be on pay per view or do you know yet? I don't know. I was, I was going to ask you. No, yeah, no, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. <laughs> well, my my reason for asking is is because you get another win. You know, you just said you brought back the you brought back the call out. You're the guy who reinvented it. You you know you got to have something good to say on the microphone afterwards, right? And you know I will. <laughs> I love you know it. I will. Come on, man. <laughs> that's it was, this is, this is, Yeah, you know I will. I know. I, I, that's what I said. That's you. You've made it part of your fights now. If we, if you don't get that, that's why I said there's no way they can't give you the microphone after a fight at this point. Yeah, yeah. I guess. I mean, I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. It would be very cool if we uh, like kicked off the main card. But that that whole card's so freaking stacked that I'm not getting my hopes up. Yeah, I've well, been I've been better. Man, you know, I I got to be uh, I headlined the fight pass, and then I I was the second I was uh, right before the co-main, and then I was the co-main, and now this is my my fourth UFC fight. You know, if they could put me anywhere, I'm happy to be on the card. Um, yo, but yeah, if you if I had my pick, I'd be I think I'd open up that main card, fight at ten, boom. I think that would be sweet. Yeah, I think that's a great way to kick it off, too. I mean, you get three title fights. You need a great way to grab people at the beginning of the card. And, and then uh, you go, yeah, and you go Wonderboy, Wonderboy Mosby all right after me. Yeah, I think that's a great way to go. I think and it's a great way to go. Three titles. Yeah, what a and you know yeah. talk about talk about a, a crazy moment being able to kick off one of the biggest pay per views of all time. That would be a great way to go. Yeah, I, it would be an honor, man, and, and I, I know I. You got to know I'm going to bring that fucking energy. I'm going to bring, I'm, I, you know, I, yeah, you, I should be on, I should be on a pay-per-view, man. I, 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 you know, I'm going to do something special in there that night. I, yeah. I, I can feel it. I, I, I can feel it. Something special is going to happen. I love it. I love it. Well, Mickey, I always appreciate taking time, man. It's been, it's been, it's been weird. You you haven't been around as much, so I've been excited. I saw that name pop up there. It's like, boom, I'm so excited you're back. The fans are excited you're back. And uh, you bring a certain energy and a certain level to your fights that just isn't out there. So I'm excited to see you back in action, man. It feels like it's been too long. Thanks, Damon, man. I appreciate you saying that. It's nice uh, talking to you. You got, you just gave me a whole bunch of energy doing this call right now, man. I'm about to have to go work out or something. <laughs> I love it. Well, no, I, I just saw the movie It. I thought, I saw the movie It. That's why it was a 615 movie. That's why I had to run. <laughs> well, you, did you like the movie though? Because I loved it. I saw it last week and it was really good. Well, I, I liked it. I'm, I'm not much of a, of a, like a horror drill, like type guy, but I, my my buddy he, my buddy Rich Petition has been talking about that play forever or that uh, that movie for forever so I, I had to go see it with him it was cool I I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, man, safe training during camp, man. Obviously excited to see you back. Look forward to seeing you in New York here, and uh, you know, not too long from now. 
Yeah, man. And then I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you, I'm sure, fight week. And then I'll talk to you at the post fight press conference. Absolutely. I, lo- I, I love I have it. I a big smile on my face. <laughs> I have a big ass smile on my face. I love it. Mickey, I always appreciate the time, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, my friend. All right, bye bye. I think it's a good choice. Just stay right there, bro. Mickey Gall's a hell of a guy, too. I ran into him after he beat up on CM Punk in Cleveland. He was, well, we we all stayed at the same hotel, but we saw him outside with his parents, and me and Matt, Matt Brown, walked up, and he was like, Matt Brown! <laughs> and he was, like, super respectful, just a great kid, man. Yeah. One of our drunk buddies goes, oh, my God, Matt Brown against Mickey Gall. Mickey Gall goes, I don't know if I'm ready for all that, man. <laughs> He's like, I'm just getting started here, bro. Yeah, he's two fights into his UFC career, or three fights into his UFC career. Mm-hmm. Slow down. Really special moment till our buddy ruined it. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> till everybody ruined it. No, I said till our buddy ruined it. Yeah. Our drunk buddy. Yeah, that's going to be uh, that's gonna be the show, man. We, uh, we have got to say that uh, we're going to be down in Norfolk. Yes, Virginia. So you're going to go, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going. I got my hotel. I'm, I'm good. So I'm we're, sleeping on your couch. We're officially going to be down there, and that is uh, the 11th. November 11th, the weekend yeah. after UFC 217. So just to let people know, maybe we can do like some sort of meetup. You know, we'll see what the response is. If you guys are down for a meetup, why don't you hit us up on Twitter at Jeremy Loper, at Damon Martin. Use the hashtag Fight Society, and we'll see what the interest is, and maybe we can find somewhere where we can do like a little cool podcast meetup. Like, it, is, it, up, is, it, is a, it is a special occasion. It's Matt Brown, who is still a – ceremonial co-host of this show absolutely uh his retirement fight and matt has said you know when once re- once retirement is done he would like to come back and start doing the podcast more regularly which is awesome so i talked to mark coleman too so uh, i think we'll have a update on a development of him coming back oh at least uh, as uh, to coley. give us a update on his life and wh- what's going on with the uh, first ever ufc champion yeah coley uh yeah, coley messaged me not that long ago i put up a picture from the podcast a couple weeks ago with you, me, and Matt, and, yeah. and Coley, and I think Rich Franklin was in the picture, and Coley messaged me. He said, take it down or pay me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. He, said, you're about, you, he said, you're about to get a headbutt, son. <laughs> Coming for you, brother. I'm going to turn you into that heavy bag from the, from the Hammer House. That's right. Man, if people have never heard that, we got to do something with the archives. I, I've thought about that so much of the old show that we did, the yeah. great MMA debate, when it was me, you, Mark Coleman, and Matt Brown every week. Yeah. And Coleman would tell the most ridiculous stories on earth. Somehow, we need to get those and edit them down and have like, and now, Mark Coleman, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, yeah. moments. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely had a few of those. A moment with Mark. All right, dude, anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, no, just uh, follow along on Twitter at Jeremy Loper, at Damon Martin. We'll be back next week. We're going to talk uh, UFC fight night in Brazil. As I mentioned, Colby Covington's going to be on the show. Derek Brunson's going to be on the show. we got a lot of UFC 217 stuff coming up. I just talked to the champ yesterday, Ioana Jacek. Fire. Yes. Fire interviews. So awesome. stay tuned for that as well. All right, so you here's your homework assignment. Watch 31. It's a Rob Zombie movie. Yeah, I, I wanted to see it. I haven't seen it okay, yet. Okay, so it's Saw meets the hunger games and it's fucking awesome okay okay it's his latest one you're gonna love it the placement of classic rock in zombie movies it's unreal man it really is i'll watch it this week. i can't wait all right so we'll talk about that next week and if you haven't follow along on the youtube channel too it's loper and randy check it out man it's my family behind the scenes on our radio show and everywhere else hashtag fight society thanks guys